Hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe series where we're looking at the passing of knowledge through time starting with the Egyptian dynasties and we have moved up to the 14th dynasty where we're looking at uh, it actually sits in between the same time period as our last video the 13th dynasty in the second intermediate period which is extremely important because these two periods run side by side and the reason for that is these two king lists now we've seen this in the very beginning of the dynasty journey uh, in the kind of second and third videos back um, in the series where the kingdom splits once again into various parts this happens again and again and even though it's been united uh, once upon a time you know and then broken apart again then united once more these realms or areas tend to stick in the cultures and the people's minds where they know that even though um, it is one unified country and has been for many generations the upper part is different to a lower part and is even the middle kingdom as well and this is set by the design of Toth and it, it probably stems to the fact that all three parts have their own kind of infrastructures uh, although united by one uh, ruler from time to time each three parts would primarily have their own cultures um, and particularly the uh, lower kingdom which is actually in the north you would uh, when I first started looking at the dynasties and the areas of Egypt whenever the lower kingdom was referred to you instantly think of in the south but actually the lower kingdom is in the north based around the Nile uh, the Nile Delta which is kind of contradictory to what you would might think but the lower kingdom in this case began to be ruled by a different set of kings or pharaohs and this is quite important because the delta is um, predominantly where a lot of the food sources and crops are grown and um, it's where it has a lot of um, trade values well being the access to the north because you would need to go through the uh, lower kingdom in the north to get through uh, places such as Jerusalem, Phoenicia, Samaria, Arabia everything else you have to either sail across um, the channel there to Arabia or you know head down to Africa so the lower kingdom uh, up around the Nile Delta is quite a key location and quite sought after uh, for, for many of the kings and we see this here so in the intermediate period in the 13th dynasty we saw that the kings kind of relinquish their power and um, have a very minimalistic role compared to the other wealthy nobles and lords in the area However, this changes. So we, we saw and we predominantly picked out a key feature in the last video of an individual, uh, you know, not terribly important um, in terms of the actual line itself, except he was one of the main holders and passed it on to his son, um, Najib Embra. But the, the man in question um, called Swadad Yikar, Jakar, actually had two sons now we know that the line of knowledge always gets passed on to the eldest as is the king making ritual from the horus to the osiris role within the court of the king and the trance state used within the uh, pyramids and the obelisks as such but his second son nahesi in 1705 bc actually became king also and this wasn't because his older brother died it was because he took power in the lower kingdom and up around the, the Nile Delta and this is very important because it's extremely rare that we get two actual official named kings normally you have the king line and then if you have a usurper that's come from a noble family or somewhere else they are noted as a king but not of royal blood not of God not god men or of a god or because um, the kings remember played the roles of gods and kind of um, with a microcosmic orbit of the macrocosmic god context that, that was given by Toth and we watched in the very first video so if you haven't go back and check that out but the um, idea of gods were the um, kind of manifestation of certain elemental powers so for example uh, the, you know the god of um, the underworld Seth for example was considered um, you know, he, he was a ruler of the 
un under kingdom which was underground under the pyramids which is where the tribal people first emerged from after the flood and he ruled that area and that then quickly uh, became the actual lower kingdom itself so not then figuratively but actual a lower kingdom being up in the north um, so the underworld or the lower kingdom beneath ground became the lower kingdom above ground and he um, the, the, the spirit of the underworld of a lower kingdom was um, you know that was the kind of culture of the people made into a, a manifestation of a god so the god didn't mean what we think of as a god today it meant the spirit of the people which is quite important actually when we look at our next set of videos and the spirit or the it, it's difficult to explain in one video without going into too much detail but when they called the a god a god it wasn't a, a, an individual a person like we imagine it to be today it was um, a higher power that encompassed uh, an entirety of a um, paradigm or a, um, a philosophy and the individual that ruled that was that concept made manifest so he was a archetype a psychological archetype of that context and so seth was the ruler of the lower kingdom um, who represented that uh, culture as such and he was a role that was played by individuals usually the king's younger brother which is interesting because again if the king um his younger brother was Nehesi, who would take on the role of Seth, which is extremely interesting because that was the king ritual itself, part of it, is that when the king died, Osiris died, but the two younger siblings, um, Horus, the older sibling, became the king Osiris, and the um, second born, which played the role of Anubis at the time, actually became Seth, um, the king's brother and they would typically rule the upper and lower kingdom jointly together and that was the time that happened at the time of Toth and we see this again so whether or not that was proclaimed or if Nehesi saw that yes this is my ritual this is my birthright I'm going to go and claim the lower kingdom from the nobles and did that is quite likely so he may have took that area by force or by you know economic or politics or whatever and we see that role fulfilled in him, but we don't see his older brother, Nishembre, play his part. Yes, he plays the role, yes, he becomes king, but he doesn't take over part of the country. It remains a side role. So actually, Nehesi becomes more powerful than his older brother. And so we can put that down to almost a sibling rivalry. And interestingly enough, what we find out later at the end of the 14th dynasty is that actually for what the first time in history yes we have this story that Seth hates Osiris and they battle each other but that's a play it's a role to be fulfilled the actual families have never fought one another they've never actually been at odds with one another it's this um, symbolic role of taking power but in this case the true born or the, the higher born um, role of Osiris because normally what you would think is if if this if the younger son is trying to usurp the throne he will claim the title of osiris for himself but he doesn't he stays wearing the red crown and plays the role of seth so he doesn't even try and take the role of osiris and the reason for that is because the king making ritual itself is still in play and he has great respect for it as that's the way his family's been brought up it's part of their culture so he knows yes he's a ruler in his own right but really the honorable thing to do is let his older brother still become osiris um that's the important thing but what he maybe didn't realize at the time or maybe didn't care is that only osiris gets given true pure line of knowledge and so nehesi never gets that yes he takes the kingdom yes he plays the role of seth yes he has a role in the court but he'll never have the true line of knowledge, the king-making ritual, um, and the secrets that go with that, because he, he would, the second born would never be part of the ritual, the king-making ritual, and therefore never know its secrets. If that makes sense, it's only known from father to son and the priest line who attends. 
very important. So yes, Nehesi is a king. Yes, he is designated as Seth, the ruler of the lower kingdom. Um, and actually the two families don't like each other. So maybe this was done in spite or against the will of the main family, who knows? But what for the first time in history, 14th dynasty kings are not liked by the main 13th dynasty kings which have the older, uh, older sibling king making ritual right. And that's extremely important as we move on to something that needs to be solidified as a foundation moving forward. Now, the Hesse also, this is very important, moves away from the general Egyptian civilization. Now, yes, he's part of Egypt and the Egyptian dynasties. However, he is named the Hyksos king. And the Hyksos people in particular. Now, this is extremely important because the Hyksos people actually played host to a group of travellers that came from the north. And again, if you're a traveller coming from the north, coming from Samaria, the first place you're going to hit is upper, uh, sorry, the lower Egypt, which is in the upper end of the Nile. And so that's the first point of contact with the Egyptian civilization you're going to meet. And he plays host to these people. And we'll look at this a lot in more detail in another video that's coming soon. But this group of people set up residence at the bequest of Nehesi, or his family line, this line. It could be later on down the line, but it's this group of people, Hyksos kings, that um, allow these people to settle. And what happens is Hyksos actually become, or claim to be, a separate state or civilization to the main Egyptian civilization. So we're not just having two kings in the same civilization fighting each other but equally do know they set apart the same culture they completely say no we are our own people we are the Hyksos kings we are the Hyksos people um, we are not part of the Egyptian kingdom anymore we are better than that and that's what possibly sparks off this conflict between the two parts of the family now, what we do see after 1705 BC in the Lower Kingdom, in the Hyksos Kings, so we will refer to them as the Hyksos people, the Hyksos Kings, then, is we see a line of successors, very similar to the intermediate period where quick succession follows in a short period of time, because the last known uh, member of the Hyksos Kings um, in the 14th dynasty is Apepi, or Apophis, which we'll look at later, who rules in 1590. So in just around about 100 years, we have a lot of kings. We have um, a, a fair amount of people. So I'll go very quickly for the list. It doesn't really hold any relevance. We don't really have any contributions in terms of cultural value. Um, but we have Kahahwe Nethembre, Sehebre, Merida Jafar, Sewadjukar II, Webinar, Awaber II, Hariber, Nebsener, um, Sekeheperner, Bejed Kemohemer, Semkeheber II, Akamawa, uh, Nethembre, Ahakar, Akar, Jeten Jedekar, Salatis, Sakaha, and Keham, and then finally Apepi or Apophis. And we can see that some of these names are very similar to the original king line as well, which also, you know, solidifies that we know the father to some, but we also know that we are related because they're using such as the same names ending in car and far. And that's extremely important as we move on because we must establish these ties. Now, in this period of time, um, say the Hyksos people become... Uh, almost self-sufficient and divided from the kingdom and they actually rule the, the entire lower kingdom actually doesn't just consist of kind of what we see as um, an, a, a, a Nile Delta and Egypt that way it actually spreads um, up into Jerusalem and into Phoenicia around the Mediterranean Sea claiming back a lot of the old kingdoms and this is extremely important for later on in our video so that entire area and there'll be a should be a picture on this video as well, it shows that, that kingdom uh, and its location 
put that kingdom of, uh, up into Phoenicia and uh, Jerusalem and um, what we see as kind of the Jewish uh, you know, um, Middle East today that was all owned by um, Hyksos kings. That's extremely important. So when we look at now the 1590 BC to 1540 BC, Apepi and Apophis, the Hyksos king, Apophis, um, so what happens is, obviously they have this role of Seth and Osiris, but that actually changes. So the role of Seth becomes Apophis, and now Apophis, interestingly enough, was the counterpart to Ra and considered to be a large snake um, of darkness or the hidden. And more specifically, the hidden is more important, more accurate. So you have the light and the sun, and then you have the hidden um, and the dark and the snake and Apophis. And Ra is meant to fight Apophis, and that's extremely important because remember, Osiris and Horus are part of the temple of Ra uh, and kind of the male kingship, whereas Hathor is the moon. And so there is actually no official role for Apophis, it's always seen as the absence of the sun and the light and knowledge. Whereas Apophis and the snake is very interesting because it's not a negative, it's the, it's the hidden, it's the hidden knowledge. And when these travellers come from the north, what we actually see is there is another link in their line of knowledge, which we will look at later, which relates to the snake being knowledgeable, the line of knowledge, the passing of knowledge and the hidden secrets of the universe. And so it's an amalgamation of these two systems put together. And so the role of Seth gets set aside because Seth traditionally in the stories always gets beaten. He's the under, um, is the, is the lesser brother as such. So although he has taken that role to begin with in the line of Hyksos Kings, the role of Seth gets shed and set aside because the role of Apophis indicates one of the two great beings, Apophis and Ra, the highest, um, the highest level of attainment in the universal study of the sun and um, the snake or the hidden, the darkness. And it's not, again, it's, it's not a negative connotation. It's not a darkness and evil. It's darkness as in um, the negative space, the minus vibration. So we have a positive negative vibration to everything. And so it's like a black hole and a sun. And what the name Apophis doesn't mean he is Apophis. It means he's probably uh, the king of Apophis or the son of Apophis, the son of a god, just like Osiris is the son of Ra. It's that equilibrium. So he's trying to establish himself as an equal footing to Osiris and the god of Ra. It's like, well, actually, I am my own king. Um, this is my kingdom. We follow the hidden knowledge, the hidden knowledge which has come from this group of travellers from the north um, and the Hyksos people are an amalgamation of that so yes they are Egyptian but they've set up their own kingdom and they're playing host to these new individuals uh, with their own systems of knowledge which we'll look at um, but it's important to note these, ter these terms that Apophis and Ra, Apophis and Osiris um, Osiris are the same level, they're the same title, they're a king and a king a duality for positive, negative, not morality, but just opposites of forces. But what is very important is that Apepi Apophis here does still recognize that the king making ritual and the line of thought rests with the other line. Although they might hate each other, they might be warring with each other on this level, he still recognizes that fact. That is something he will not have. That line has been passed through time, through those predecessors of the 13th dynasty, and he will not have that. So he has had to look elsewhere to claim his rulership. Because remember, it's not just the kings that know this, the people know this as well. This is a well-known fact within the people, it keeps the rulers in power that they have this knowledge, they have this line, and they use it to benefit the people. Um, they enter these higher trance states and meditations to bring back information from um, the universe to better cultivate their civilization. And if he doesn't have that, then the people know this, and he knows this, and his family knows this. So he must gain knowledge from somewhere else. So we can see why he turns to these people um, to find 
another way, another way of benefiting himself and family and his people to make them predominant over his um, previous um, kind of relations uh, line of the original Osiris and Ra and the kingmaking ritual. So what he does is actually make his own kingmaking ritual, and we will look at that in a later video. But for now, we need to recognise what the Hyksos people are, who they are, who they're related to, um, what they mean in this position, because that's something that isn't done in kind of modern history. We don't look at this and go, well, we know there's a group of Hyksos people here, and we know we're kings, but why are they kings? We don't really look at that which is extremely strange. It's not very well mentioned that the bloodlines are linked. It doesn't note the symbology of the swapping of Seth and why that Seth became Apophis. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of symbology that historians don't really care to look for. And it's because we don't have a strong understanding of the spiritual practices that were involved at those times. And yes, they can look at pictures and images and um, books and whatever, that's fine, and get the key facts, what's written. But what's not written is the spiritual practices that we still use today as spiritualists to gain knowledge and information of the universe. Things that must be done in certain ways to attain those levels of knowledge that were gained back then. And unless you've done that process, you don't know what the symbol symbolism and the symbology means at that time. And so a normal historian wouldn't make the connections needed because we don't know the process. It's like um, it's like reading about a game but not playing the game. Or it's about reading reviews of films but not watching the film. If you haven't watched the film, how do you know what really goes on? You can only take other people's opinions as fact and base it off that. And that's what historians have been doing in this time period. Whereas we need to do that. But then we need to live the film, live the movie, watch the game, whatever, and become spiritual, go through the steps of process that are used by those people at the time to benefit the kingdom and the king making ritual and things like that. And we have to experience them and then apply them back to the information we have at the time and live it as it is. And that's how we get the real set of events of the time, something that's clearly missed in modern history today. And that's what this channel is all about, following this line, but not just looking at it through the facts and the history, which obviously are important and are used, but we're looking in between the lines at the actual systems of study, spiritual practices used within that time period and applying the reasons behind what the information as we've got the reason why that information exists and what it's used for and the purpose of doing all these things and how it influences the symbology um, so that's where we're going to leave it for now at the end of the 14th dynasty we're going to jump in at the next dynasty and see how that affects the rest of our knowledge line but just know that the 14th dynasty the Hyksos kings are related um, to the kings of the 13th dynasty, uh, particularly one of the uh, younger brothers of the pharaohs who took on the role of Seth, who gained power in the lower kingdom, who then claimed independence, who allowed settlers from the north to come to help gain his um, missing knowledge passed on from the king line, and then he became, or titled himself, the king of Apophis, which is an equal set to Ra, or a new version of Osiris in the north. And that's where we're going to leave it today. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you follow us on our next video. And for now, thank you very much and take care. Hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe series where we're looking at the passing of knowledge through time, starting with the Egyptian dynasties. And we have moved up to the 14th dynasty where we're looking at, uh, it actually sits in between